All right. Thank you, Allie, for the intro. Um, and thanks to everybody who's chimed in so far. I'm not sure how many we've got. I know we've got a handful, um, but you know, the more the merrier. It doesn't matter if we have one or two, this will be fun. Um, my name is Sean Goff. I've been with the city of Raleigh for about, uh, let's see, sorry, I've got something going on with the transcript here. Um, for the city of Raleigh, about three and a half years as the land stewardship program manager, which is in the natural resources section. Um, it's been a good time. We've made a lot of strides and tonight I want to share some of those things with you all. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now and we can jump right into the presentation because I do want to make sure that I have time for questions at the end. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so tonight we're going to be kind of doing a quick talk about natural resource management in Raleigh parks and that's not just our parks that's obviously our nature preserves our greenways and our other open spaces or natural spaces. Um, we tend to think of natural resources in a lot of different ways. Um, oh, one second, let me make sure that I've got this. Here we go. All right, we tend to think of natural resources in a lot of different ways, um, and there's a lot of different ways to manage and take care of those resources. So we'll get into some of the details about that tonight. We'll start with some of the smaller, more nuts and bolts prescription type things we do, and then kind of look at the larger, maybe more landscape style management that we've been lucky enough to join into. So quick presentation outline. Uh, we're gonna look at that quick question about what natural resources are. Uh, we're going to talk about habitat patches and corridors and how vital those are, especially in an urban environment, which is where we find ourselves here in Raleigh. Uh, we're going to talk about how we figure out what's going on in those habitat patches and corridors through different monitoring and inventory strategies. And then once we know what's there, how do we manage that habitat for them? Uh, we can't do it alone, so then we'll look at some of the partnerships and collective action initiatives that we have going on, as well as some of the things that you as viewers can do to help. Um, and then lastly, we'll round it out with some questions. So when you hear natural resources, a lot of people, uh, especially if you work, let's say, for the energy sector or the energy economy, you may think of things like fossil fuels, uh, minerals, uh, lumber, timber. Um, but when we speak about natural resources, at least in this uh, context, we're talking more on the ecological side the different components or natural elements of an ecosystem that interact to create different landscapes and different overall ecologies altogether. Uh, we're talking about the non-living things, the soils, the geology, the topography, the water. Uh, we're talking about weather and climate and fire, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Uh, we're talking about the living things, the plants and the wildlife that also are a vital interacting resource, a vital interacting piece of uh, landscape ecology. And then not only that, but the natural processes themselves. So a lot of people are familiar with the benefits of, you know, trees produce oxygen and lakes and streams and vegetated areas help control stormwater and flooding. Um, but we're looking at processes such as habitat resiliency and how are different species allowed to reproduce and disperse uh, upon reproduction. And how can we kind of connect all these resources to make sure that these processes stay intact as much as they can? Um, as you can imagine, managing natural resources, managing different ecosystems within an urban environment is a lot different than if you were, let's say, out west somewhere managing a thousand acres on uh, Bureau of Land Management uh, property, for example. So we have a lot of different types of inputs and a lot of different types of pressures, uh, sometimes on all sides of these properties and all sides of these corridors that we have to consider when we're developing different management strategies. All right, another quick clarifier. Uh, when we talk about wildlife management, a lot of the times we're talking about habitat management because it's not very common, at least in our agency, where we're going to be directly, directly manipulating wildlife. We're not going to be introducing wildlife or removing wildlife in most cases, unless it's a nuisance animal. And that's something like animal control or a uh, wildlife resources commission. Uh, what we're talking about is building suitable habitat for the different types of wildlife, plant, whatever groups and species that we know are either native to this area or once here or should be here and we try to build these different habitat patches i guess we can go ahead and call them um, based on those needs uh, we then try to figure out how can we connect these different habitat patches because by 
nature, our properties in terms of parks and preserves are constrained in their size. We can only provide so much habitat. And when I say habitat, I don't mean necessarily breeding habitat or habitat where different species are going to stay year long, but it's a type of area where they can at least spend some time and they can have some of their resources met or some of their resource needs met. Um, we develop and craft management plans that prescribe different actions to help us reach this goal of, of, uh, of creating suitable habitat. And then we try to have influence on different city planning and zoning ordinance um, decisions uh, that we can hopefully slant them in the direction of protecting these different habitats and even more vitally in some cases the connections between these habitats. Uh, I couldn't help but include the old field of dreams um, cliche if you build it they will come. That was a common misconception especially in the early days of habitat management. We thought if we met all their needs that these animals would then or animals wildlife insects whatever uh, would then sort of repopulate. But without those connections, uh, you're really not going to guarantee success at that scale. Let's get a little bit more into habitat patches and wildlife corridors, because that's a lot of what our properties, to me at least, represent. Uh, the parks, the nature preserves, and other larger natural areas can serve as these habitat patches, again, where different wildlife of different needs, uh, different seasonalities can stop in, and whether they're staying there for the long term, uh, predominantly, though, that would be a smaller species like a bird or a small mammal, or they're passing through like white-tailed deer, coyote, or larger mammals. Uh, there's at least uh, available resources there for them to have some of their needs met. That's what we are talking about. We're talking about habitat patches. Uh, greenways, utility right-of-ways, and riparian buffers that are along streams and uh, the Noose River, for example, serve as travel or dispersal corridors for different plants and wildlife. So where we can't have their needs, all their needs met in some of these wildlife, I'm sorry, in some of these habitat patches, we have to make sure that there's different connections and different avenues for them to take to find those and meet those needs elsewhere in different habitat patches, whether that's still within the urban environment or maybe outside the city limits to where it becomes a little bit more rural and they have a little bit more room and there's a little bit more resources there uh, available for them. Connecting these habitat islands using the right-of-ways, the greenways especially, is one of the greatest ecological services that Raleigh Parks provides. And I want to key on the fact that I'm saying ecological services because we do provide a lot of services in terms of recreation, community centers, and stuff like that. But from the natural resources aspect and the ecological side of things, uh, preserving and protecting and managing these habitat patches and these connection corridors is one of the greatest things that we can do, and it's one of our highest priorities. Uh, I'd like to include this map. This is Southeast Raleigh. It's not the clearest thing to see, but it's right where the inner belt line kind of connects to 87, heading east towards uh, Zebulon and Nightdale. And I like this picture because you can see how developed everything is in this area but then how constrained all these wildlife corridors and habitat patches are. The dark green line represents the Greenway Trail, and the lighter green shades represent different Greenway easements or park properties where there's a little bit more room, there's a little bit more available habitat, and they're not just travel corridors. So you can see how constricted everything is in some of these areas. Uh, the Noose River runs north to south there, kind of on the east side of your screen. Uh, that's a major travel corridor and makes things, you know, relatively easy going north to south. But if you needed to traverse, let's say you were a white-tailed deer or, or a coyote or even something else, and you needed to traverse east to west, your options are fairly limited. So we need to make sure that we protect and preserve and actually improve these corridors to, that, so that they stay viable for, uh, for transmission and dispersal of different wildlife and plants. All right. Once we know sort of what areas we want to key on, uh, we then need to figure out what we have in these areas. What's in our different parks, our preserves, what's along our greenways? Which it's, it's important to know before we dive into in, in any sort of management planning to know what we have so that we can identify rare protected species or something that we're keying on a lot more uh, lately is locally rare or uncommon species because they could be uh, relatively stable in terms of their entire home range, but within the city of Raleigh, because all, of all the urbanization and all those pressures and inputs and outputs that we were talking about, uh, they're not super common. 
So those are species we need to start looking at now, knowing that the urbanization pressures are having an impact and how can we protect these species to make sure that they're representative examples uh, within these habitat patches and using these corridors. Uh, we look at old historic inventories a lot of times that tells us what was once there and then maybe we can backtrack and reverse engineer to figure out what part of that habitat or what resource that they need is missing and then we can work to restore or at least improve that resource in hopes of, of restoring that that species. Um, and then looking at how many species, looking at when the different species use these habitats in these corridors and the amount of use that they get really help guide our management actions. In order to figure out what we do have to conduct that biological monitoring, that inventory work, we use a lot of different methods. Um, as you can see here, camera traps are an excellent way to figure out what we have. Uh, and you are, or at least I am very surprised at several of these things that turned up in my three and a half years working in Raleigh. I know a lot of other folks are typically surprised too. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, there is a bobcat that we caught that's down at Walnut Creek Wildlife. Uh, I'm sorry, Walnut Creek Wetland Center, uh, which is inside the belt line, inside the inner belt line. We have a family of beavers. We have plenty of white tailed deer, wood ducks. And uh, this was also captured down at Walnut Creek using trail cameras. The family of otters that's been there for several years now. Um, but that's a great indication that what we're doing in that area is maintaining that habitat. We're preserving those resources and we are, at least for now, sort of holding back any of the negative pressures that are associated with urbanization, uh, with stormwater issues, with pollution uh, that would ordinarily drive a family of otters to find a different habitat somewhere further outside of the city. Uh, I have another neat video to show you. This is the best video I've ever seen of a wild mink, and this was captured at Durant Nature Preserve earlier this year. I do want to make a quick uh, disclaimer. There's uh, the mink is carrying a dead rabbit, so it's a little bit graphic for those who may have a sensitive stomach, um, but it's neat. You know, this is wildlife at work, and you'll see this small mink who's carrying a rabbit about one and a half times his size. Uh, that sort of wildlife is something that we haven't recorded before. We didn't know persisted. We didn't know existed. We assumed that they had all sort of moved out to the outskirts of town uh, where there was less pressure, less people. But here we have one that obviously seems to be um, setting up shop there at Durant Nature Preserve. And this video is especially unique because it's in the middle of the day. Um, and this mink seems unfazed by the people who are there recording them. This is one of our staff members who was there. And I don't know how many pictures and photos I've seen of minks that were just blurs where you could see tails or heads or, um, you know, two or three seconds of a clear defined shot. This is one of the best videos I've seen uh, collected definitively. Pops right up underneath into a little burrow. So now that we know we've got all this cool stuff, we know that uh, a diverse group of plants and wildlife are using our habitats and using our uh, corridors. How can we ensure that these habitat and corridors are uh, stay at a high enough quality to where that resource, those resources that they need, are always met, and making sure that they persist um, and continually use those those uh, resources that we provide. Uh, vegetation management at its most simplistic form is one of the biggest thing we do, whether that's for native or non-native plants. Uh, we could be mowing or cutting or spraying, but uh, it's all with a target, it's all with an objective, and it's all with a habitat improvement strategy uh, behind it. We started using pre uh, prescribed fire a lot more uh, to help us with vegetation management. Um, we also look at managing non-native uh, wildlife wherever we can. Uh, especially forest pests like the emerald ash borer, uh, new threats like the spotter, spotted lanternfly. So whenever we can find those, we start to develop different management strategies to hopefully address uh, whatever threats those present. Uh, where feasible and where practical, we look at hydrological restoration. So for the example, uh, uh, Horseshoe Farm has a small upland wetland that was ditched and, coal, and uh, there was a culvert installed years ago back in the uh, previous landowners days of uh, agricultural practices, which, you know, 90% of the Piedmont 
region uh, had some sort of agriculture practice on it at some point. So there were a lot of ditching. There was a lot of culverts installed. There was a lot of drainings of upland wetlands. And so we find areas where um, that exists on city of Raleigh sites. And if it's appropriate and we do a good enough study and we decide that restoration of that wetland or of that uh, stream bed is appropriate, then we will look into uh, implementing that. Um, and at the most fundamental uh, service, you know, we provide protection and preservation of these different habitats uh, just by being under park purview and, and managed by parks um, and greenways. We are ensuring that development and other negative pressures that would wipe out habitat like that uh, are abated. Now, we can't have a whole lot of say in what our neighbors do, but we have to understand that that is part of the wildland urban interface. That's part of the urban pressure that we are constantly managing for every day. So by ensuring that our habitat area, that our availability and our resources are high quality um, and not invaded or not degraded, then we're doing our, our part to provide that and ensure that service for the wildlife and the ecology of Raleigh. Uh, vegetation management, this gets a little bit more into the nuts and bolts. Uh, native plants versus non-native plants, we're, we're managing for both. Native plants, we're typically trying to add more, um, especially those that may be rare or projected. Uh, we're trying to identify those and make sure that we uh, eliminate any sort of, of negative pressure. Sometimes deer browse can be a huge impact, so we need to make sure we are fencing off some small populations of rare plants before they get snipped up by deer. Uh, ATV use and trespass can be an issue in some areas for rare plants. So we're looking at ways to work with Raleigh Police Department uh, to prevent that from going on. Uh, we err towards the size, side of mechanical control for the most part, which is your mowing, your cutting, disking, weeding, anything that sort of mechanically uh, reduces or removes the vegetation. And that's used in, in conjunction with other management practices like prescribed fire and sometimes with chemical control. Um, it's important for us to note every time we talk about herbicide use in Raleigh Parks that we point out that our goal is safe, responsible, and effective applications every time. We are using specifically targeted herbicides at the lowest rates that we can use them to maintain uh, efficacy. And these are uh, aquatic approved herbicides in every case, whether we're upland or we're lowland. And we're making sure that our uh, off target species are not affected as much as possible. Uh, once we have managed some of these areas uh, with mechanical or chemical control, then we'll typically come back in with native grasses, shrubs, and trees in order to supplement whatever may already be growing there, uh, the more desirable native vegetation that we're going for. Prescribed fire is a neat topic that uh, a lot of people are sort of wary of when they first hear about it. Um, pres uh, prescribed fire sort of acts to mimic the natural disturbance that fire, which was once really common on the landscape, created uh, in the southeast United States. Fire, whether through lightning strikes or through uh, indigenous peoples lighting fires, uh, helped shape the entire ecosystem. Uh, it was millennia of, of constant fires, whether they were uh, repeated fires at low intervals or they were more spaced out and maybe a little bit more intense. Um, you can see that map there on the right hand side of your screen. The darker the red, the more repeated the fire was. So if you look down in Florida in the deepest red, there was wildfire in that state of a reasonable scale every roughly every two years. Now this is this is an average. So up in North Carolina and in Raleigh, where we are, we're kind of teetering on that four to six and that six to eight year range. So natural fire would have been pretty common. And it's amazing what you can do when you apply fire under the right conditions to the right places. Um, it aids in vegetation management and nutrient cycling, and it actually stimulates the germination of some plants, including a really rare North Carolina plant. Uh, it's called redwood lettuce, Lentuca hirsuta. It was unobserved in the state for 50 years until we did a small burn at Wilkerson Nature Preserve two years ago. And with that single burn, this plant magically appeared back in this small plot and thankfully we have a really good botanist there on staff so he was able to identify it and notify uh the heritage program and, and the necessary people to come out and document that yeah that was the first record of that in 50 years and all because of a single fire 
So it's it's uh, it's remarkable what you can get done if you apply these management tactics under the right conditions. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cough. I'm trying to maintain and get through as much as I can before uh, coughing my butt off. Um, so uh, again, just like with herbicide applications, we're making sure that all our controlled burns are well planned. Safety is the highest priority. Uh, protecting property and neighbors' houses is something of uh, paramount concern. We always look at what the weather and the fuel conditions say. We look at where the smoke is going to go to make sure that we're not blowing it into an area where there may be um, smoke sensitive people, um, elementary schools, uh, retirement communities, or any uh, maiden highways or uh, avenues of transportation like Interstate 40, for example. Um, we build nice wide control lines and we build in a lot of uh, contingency plans. So whenever we do enact prescribed fire, all right, so I wanted to share an example of hydrological restoration uh, that we get into, and this is a project that is ongoing, slated to start construction, I believe, next year in 2024. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Durant Nature Preserve, there are two lakes on the property. One, the larger lake, here's the lower lake on the uh, right-hand side of that um, picture. Uh, the dam that holds that lake, the impoundment that holds that lake, was replaced about six years ago. And in the upper lake, the dam now is due to be replaced. Uh, but instead of replacing an impoundment and creating sort of an artificial pond or, or lake as we have, uh, we looked into ways we could restore a more natural hydrological system this still provides storm water benefit, sediment removal control, uh, but acts, you know, really uh, focuses on um, access to wildlife habitat that's not available in a lot of other areas. So we are currently in works with stormwater um, and different contract designers to develop that upper lake into a wetland, a functional multivariate wetland with different depths and different cells to create kind of a mosaic habitat feature. Uh, similar to what's down in that bottom right hand picture. We hope it looks that nice. <laughs> oh, excuse me. We hope it looks that nice. But uh, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of planning, and there's a lot of follow up management that's going to go along with that. Uh, but that'll be a really neat feature, something that's not very common uh, in other Raleigh Parks properties. Um, so when we were talking about the monitoring and inventory, trying to figure out what we have on some of these sites in order to better protect and manage for them. Uh, this is another really cool case study where we had enlisted a group of NC State students to come out to a property uh, that was City of, uh, City of Raleigh Parks owned, but uh, hadn't really had much inventory or monitoring conducted on it. So with the NC State students out there conducting some of their preliminary monitoring, they actually identified a state threatened fish species, which was something I had never heard of until they picked it out. Um, it's the least brook lamprey. It's uh, really small, about four inches when it's an adult, uh, but it's got a unique life cycle where it will, uh, when it's an adult, it will spawn um, and then immediately die. And then the fertilized spawn lays in the sediment for three to five years, uh, not really as an egg, not really as a larva, but more of this sort of intermediate filter feeding sort of organism that's anchored on the gravel substrate. And it grows and grows. And eventually after three or four years, it's ready to become an adult. Um, it breeds, it spawns and then dies and the cycle starts again. So you can imagine any animal that lives on gravel substrate for that period of time is really uh, susceptible to sedimentation uh, damage to the threat of uh, a big load of silt or sediment coming in and smothering that and covering that uh, stream bed, which would essentially smother out that year's crop of young. So once we were able to identify these on the site, we were able to get out there, we were able to evaluate the extent of them, find out where they were, were um, persisting. Um, and mostly through that middle upper tributary, as you can see in the map, we identified several nesting sites and year after year we go back and we continue to find them. Um, I want to play this quick video. This is taken by the NC State students the day they found them. 
and you can see they look like small eels kind of swimming in the water. And um, really kind of perplexing and something that a lot of people haven't seen before. And in fact, uh, I don't think the sound is on this video, but there's an NC State student in the background saying those are like animals, right? And the other person says, yeah, definitely, because it's just an unusual sight. It looks like something, uh, you know, aquatic worms or something like that, something you wouldn't expect to see, especially in that shallow water. So uh, finding out these, these were there, we were able to put in management uh, steps for it. And we were able to actually reroute a sewer line system that was coming in for the properties that's to the southwest and south of the track there on the map. Those are unfortunately slated for development. And one of the sewer lines was going to build be built directly uphill um, of the one of the spawning beds or one of the more uh, productive spawning reaches of the stream. And we were able to meet with the developers and meet with Wildlife Resources Commission and, and agree that moving that was the best idea. And none of that would have been possible had we not had, you know, eyes on the ground and, and realized that was there. So monitoring and inventory is one of the biggest things we can do. Uh, it informs all of our management decisions and uh, it's something that a lot of folks uh, at home and visitors to our parks can, can actually help with. And we'll get into that a little bit later, too. Uh, Raleigh Parks can't do it by ourselves. Obviously, we have a lot of different partners, NC State, Wildlife Resources, I mentioned them before, but also the Forest Service, Wake Audubon, the Natural, uh, Museum of Natural Sciences, and Wake Nature. Um, and with their help, their support, uh, we've actually pushed the city of Raleigh to engage into several different and, and impactful, hopefully, uh, E, uh, ecological initiatives. So number one, Biophilic Cities is a worldwide initiative that we as a city joined in 2022. Uh, it's a commitment from different partner cities all across the globe. Uh, it's the conservation of natural resources and the education piece that's that's involved with that is, is something that we are looking into. How do we maximize our efforts? How do we maximize our exposure? And how do we get everyday citizens involved with some of the things that we need to do, some of the initiatives that on the smaller scale that we need to implement in order to really achieve the goals that are outlined with the Biophilic Cities mission statement. So we have Lights Out Rally is another smaller initiative that actually contributes to the Biophilic Cities uh, designation. Uh, I wanted to point this out because we are currently in this time frame of uh, between September 10th and November 30th. So uh, we, City of Raleigh works with Wake County Audubon to observe the Lights Out Raleigh period. Uh, City of Raleigh buildings and sites during this time will actually dim or turn off lights in order to prevent confusing migrating birds that pass during the fall. Uh, there's also a second period during the spring between March 15th and May 31st. So between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., we make sure that all the lights are off or they maybe have shades or they're dimmed at the very least. Um, we are trying to encourage other uh, businesses, um, agencies, um, different organizations to participate as well with the goal of reducing the amount of light pollution in Raleigh down by 40 percent. Um, there are things that folks can do at home, too, like I said, either by completely observing the lights out rally and having their lights out between those periods or you installing light shades motion sensors and then of course native plants to help refuel these birds as they migrate through so this is a neat initiative that that folks at home can take part of part in um tree city usa and the triangle tree initiative are both different tree planting uh initiatives that the city has entered um the idea is to not only plant as many trees as we can and track those trees, but also to encourage the planting of trees on private properties, whether that's through tree giveaways, um, tree planting seminars and workshops, um, pollinator seed bombs and different things that we can provide to uh, to folks to take home and actually put in their uh, in their yards or even in their neighborhoods. Uh, B City USA, similar to Tree City USA, is a commitment from our city to establish uh, bee habitat and different pollinator plots, similar to Parks for Pollinators, which is through the NRPA, and Monarch Way Stations, which is through the Monarch Watch organization. We as a city have uh, really embraced these. We have several of the examples of these all across the city. 
You can look for the little signs in a lot of cases, and it'll tell you whether it's a Monarch way station, whether it's a bee pollen air plot. Um, again, all of these things that we try to do, not only for the benefit of the, the plants and the wildlife and the insects in our area, but to provide that educational aspects and to, and to make these very visible initiatives to spark the interest and to spark some conversation uh, and encourage, hopefully, our, our citizens to take more action too collectively. All right, so speaking of how we can take this collective action and help everything in terms of natural resources within our city, uh, planting native plants in your yards and your neighborhoods is a big deal. We are currently trying to develop a program where we can work with HOAs to waive some of their maintenance guidelines to allow people to establish certified pollinator plots in their yard. We have a lot of folks who come to us and say they would love to be able to grow wildflowers and native grasses in their yard, but their HOA guidelines prevent them from having any sort of vegetation in a visible front yard area that's over a certain height. Um, so hopefully we can work with HOAs and city ordinances in order to make some sort of allowance for that. But whether you can work inside those guidelines or not, using native plants in your landscaping in your yards is a big plus for, for the native wildlife um, and insects. Um, reducing the amount of mowed areas or the areas that are really frequently mowed helps, uh, especially if those areas are near riparian buffers, so streams or rivers, lake edges or wetlands. You want to make sure that we are creating as much of a vegetated buffer for those water bodies as we can. That helps with stormwater run runoff, helps with pollution uh, filtration, it helps with creating uh, more resource food habitat, whatever it may be for the different wildlife and insects that need to, to use those areas to move through. Uh, making sure that your disposal of waste is done properly. So making sure we're not mis mixing household garbage and yard waste in those containers because those yard waste containers go to the yard waste center where they are ground up and then redistributed throughout the city as mulch. And when people throw bottles and plastic and metal and stuff like that in there, it's almost impossible for the yard waste center to be able to separate that. So a lot of it just gets ground up. And then we find that we're spreading microplastics and metal and stuff like that throughout the city. So we have since taken precautions to prevent that from happening anymore. But a big help would be when people separate their yard waste, especially from their uh, household waste. Um, participating in Lights Out Raleigh can be another big thing. Like I mentioned, having your lights off between 11 and 6 during these time periods. Um, and then check out some of the uh, the community science programs that we have. Sometimes we have bio blitz uh, events where we meet at a park or a property or a greenway parcel and we try to collect and count every plant, animal, insect, mushroom, whatever, you, you know, microorganism, if we can find it, lichen, moss, whatever we can find. We try to collect and inventory as much stuff as we can just to help us build that list. Uh, we use different uh, smartphone apps like iNaturalist and Seek which have camera functions that really help you sort of create and identify or it gets you started on identification. If nothing else, they are getting much better in terms of being correct on their observations. But um, one of the neat things about iNaturalist and Seek is that they work together where if you collect an observation in the field, you can post it to, to iNaturalist using either of those smartphone apps. And then there is a community of scientists and professionals who will then look at that photo and help you make sure that you have the correct identification. Then that is automatically uploaded to our records. So we now have inventory and data that you collected almost passively just by enjoying the parks and using some of these smartphone apps. Uh, there are different right. online inventory apps like eBird and HerpMapper. Uh, that are similar, similar to iNaturalist and Seek that help us collect more and more data of what we have on the parks. And then finally, there's a lot of volunteer work days. If you go on to the volunteer services page on the City of Raleigh website, uh, you can find a list of upcoming uh, volunteer work days and what type of work days they are. We do a lot of invasive removal work days. We do some planting work days like tree planting and uh, shrubs. So uh, take a look at that whenever you get a chance if you're interested in participating. Uh, and I think that just about wraps us up. So I'm not sure how far we are on time. I guess we're doing okay. Oh yeah, we're pretty, we're plenty early. Oh yeah. So I have uh, plenty of time for questions. And if anybody wants me to go back to a different slide or a video, um, feel free to let me know. And we can jump in whenever. Yeah.
Let's open up for questions, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sean, so much. Um, if you have a question, feel free to either write it in the chat or to unmute yourself um, and ask it out loud. I give a few minutes for them. Um, so in the meantime, I was wondering, it's probably a large question, but um, are you able to create a corridor where there currently is none, or is it more about expanding current ones and preserving current ones? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would love to be able to create where there was none, but currently, no, that's not sort of in our capabilities. If we were to get a property that, and, and in some cases there are examples where on the outskirts we have uh, leased farms that are city owned properties, but we have a lease with a farmer who is currently, you know, farming the land for however the term, however long the terms of the lease are. Uh, once those properties come into full city control, then we can then improve those. Um, but that's a little different, you know, an agricultural setting is still better than, you know, a parking lot or a strip mall where, you know, we don't typically get any property that's that's already developed or has a lot of impervious surface area and then have the opportunity to sort of like restore or revert that. A lot of what we are doing is identifying the, the most tidal corridors based on uh, location, based on constriction, you know, how tight they are. And then ensuring that those buffers and and that the overall quality of the resources within that corridor are as, are as high as they can be. Um, and then, you know, obviously the habitat patches, same thing. We're trying to make sure that we are, are improving what we currently have, managing what we currently have uh, with the hopes of maybe expanding that. That's probably more realistic than expanding corridors is, is getting... I think your connections got up briefly. Could you? Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Right, yeah, well, it. hopefully I got just about to the end of that, but yeah. Yeah, you were close. Okay. <laughs> um, so we actually are also in the process of turning our own garden here into a Monarch Way station. I don't want to speak too soon, but we might have a volunteer event coming up for helping garden and get everything done in time. Yeah, that'd be great. We have a question in the chat. Are you all actively removing nutrients? I've seen a couple of them near the Walnut Creek Greenway, and it seems like they could negatively impact the beaver population. Yeah, absolutely they can. And and we have noticed that they are there. Um, a lot of thanks to our trail cameras too in that area. Uh, we've been able to pick them out. So in areas where nutria are having a, a noticeable impact, we will either hire a, a third party contractor or we'll contact the Wildlife Resources Commission and they will come and conduct removals. Although that's few and far between. Uh, because we don't notice, at least yet, in areas where beaver and otter um, and other semi-aquatic mammals overlap, that the nutria are having that big of an impact. Um, but it's something we're definitely keeping an eye on, and, and I anticipate it becoming a larger problem as we see the states south of us, their population of nutria continues to rise. And as as things progress uh, northward, which is kind of the trend, I expect to see a lot more of them um, coming up. So we're going to have to develop some sort of formalized strategy for officially addressing them and keeping their populations at a certain level. Good question. Any other questions? I'll ask. Um, I was wondering for your specific job. What your favorite part is uh so my favorite part of this job specifically with raleigh parks is that it's it's a lot different from previous positions where i've been able to work on large tracts of land that don't have a lot of urban in, uh, influence um a lot of the natural processes are still intact and there are management prescriptions that are sort of um they're a lot easier to implement, uh, maybe not on the scale, but in terms of the science of it, right? Like they, we've identified what they need. We've identified how to address a problem. 
uh, in an urban environment, it's it keeps you on your toes. So we have some amazing areas that I would have not expected to see. Um, and then I'm left with this this conundrum of how do I protect this area? What's the best way to go about it uh, and make sure that it's not only protected for the ecological services that it provides, but Looks like we briefly lost our speaker. Hopefully he will come back in just a moment. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, sorry. Yeah, I think my connection dropped and I was able to get back on. Um, so, yeah, just to wrap up the answer to the last question. Yeah, it's 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 the intricacies of of urban ma wildlife management, habitat management um, and figuring out how to maintain some of these these areas that are really surprisingly unique. For this kind of environment and then getting that message out to people too so stuff like this really helps um before i get dropped again or cut off i wanted to give a shout out to evan preston who i see is listed as one of the uh the participants evan helped us a couple summers ago as one of our employees when he was at nc state um develop a environmental assessment tool which is a really neat thing that we are currently trying to implement on a wider scale uh, that helps us go to some of these parks, these corridors, these preserves, and look at it more objectively in terms of what sort of quality things are there, what are some of the the degradating factors that are there, um, and then come up with a an overall numerical score, um, which we can then apply to different prioritization and planning strategies. So I saw his name in the uh, in the uh, participants list. I wanted to make sure I gave him a shout out and thank him again for. For that kind of stuff so good example of how working with nc state and working with uh with local people are uh super benefited let's see he just popped one in the chat yeah good question um what other sites in raleigh are managed using prescribed burning are they mostly forested habitats or are there any native grass prairies that raleigh parks manages Working at Prairie Ridge Eco Station, I'm looking forward to hopefully doing a burn this winter. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear you're at Prairie Ridge. And if Brian Hahn is still out there, you're definitely going to be burning. Um, Brian's a great resource. And I, one of the guys that I called when I first took this job to figure out how do we burn in areas where there's an interstate on one side, there's an elementary school on the other side, there's a neighborhood of, of million dollar homes on, on the other side. Um, and so he, burning in in urban environments is tricky. So you sort of start by introducing fire in the lowest hanging fruit uh, or going after the lowest hanging fruit. So the the uh, prairies like they have at Prairie Ridge, the grasslands like they have at, at a Horsey Farm or Wilkerson or other areas like that are going to be our first targets because they're simply the easiest to burn and under the uh, the most variable of conditions, if that makes sense. Once we go underneath the canopy, underneath trees, we're looking at uh, different duff layer factors. So all that degraded pine needles and leaves creates this sort of, you know, in some areas it can be eight to 12 inches thick, in some areas it's only a couple inches thick. Uh, but when you implement prescribed fire in forested sites like that, and if you don't burn it under the right conditions, 
that fire will get down into those duff layers. Uh, it will cook feeder roots for trees. Uh, it'll smolder for days and days, creating smoke management issues um, and ultimately re uh, result in a lot of mortality of the plants that you were really trying to um, to encourage and foster. So um, the the early successional grassland areas are typically the first piece we go after. So uh, Wilkerson will be trying to burn again this winter. Uh, Horseshoe Farm, we're going to try to introduce fire to. There's a greenway parcel at Thornton Road that we're looking at doing. And then also at Lake Johnson, uh, in the southeast corner of Lake Johnson Park, there is a really unique uh, stand or area of longleaf pine, which uh, some of you may know is a more coastal species or sandhill species, but we are right on sort of the fringe of the native longleaf pine range. And we have discovered that we have 125, 130 year old plus longleaf pines in this corner. So we know fire um, as longleaf pine or fire adapted species. We know fire was was a big influence, at least in this section of the park and most likely throughout. Um, so we've done a small fire there uh, along the Greenway. We hope to burn that little piece again this year, but then also to expand more into the larger longleaf pine stand down there. So um, our priorities this year, yeah, Wilkerson Nature Preserve, Horseshoe Farm and uh, Lake Johnson. Do you have any other questions? All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you to Sean for that presentation. Um, for everyone seeking EE credit, we will be sending a follow up email um, with a form attached as well as a link to the YouTube um, video. And I believe with all of that, uh, we're all set. Um, thank you for coming, and hopefully you'll come to our next lecture in November. Thanks, folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean, if you could just like send me the uh, recording right after. <laughs>